Welcome back to Experience Focus Leaders Podcast. Today, I am very pleased to introduce you to Anthony Kopej. Anthony is a leader in global digital sales at IBM. And more importantly, he's effectively the implementer, inventor of agile selling in the enterprise. Anthony, welcome to the pod. What a blast to be here. And Anthony, I am uh, really intrigued uh, by your explanation of what you do at IBM, uh, because it's a little bit less conventional than a, you know, agile sales <laughs> leadership or whatnot. And so right. it's, and it's a little bit more realistic of the reality of the enterprise sales world from which I right. come from. So, uh -huh. you know, do you want to throw that out to our audience? Sure. So I, I like to joke. I mean, it's true, but it's, it's fun to say that I help people who think they know what they know to realize that they don't yet know what they need to know so that they can know what they don't yet know, you know? That's what I do, so. So basically back to the <laughs> Socratic, you know. Correct. Socratic <laughs> core that we don't know anything, that's why we know something. Correct. Right? Like, and, and it sounds like what you're uh, you're really implying is humility, right? Like I think some people in you're particularly correct. enterprise sales, uh, if they've been successful, they made a ton of money they've um they they can operate at very high stakes of the game they're they're kind of it's mm -hmm. a it's a 10-year track almost to get there that's results mm -hmm. driven but yet the best folks it sounds like are able to learn adapt adjust um and be agile that enterprise-wide level is that can you tell us more about how you are you know driving that at ibm which mm -hmm. by the way like for those of you that you know are new to sales um you know, what's the saying about traditional, the IBM quote is that, you know, about the, getting, nobody gets fired for buying from IBM, right? So, <laughs> so there is that sort of still legacy of like, um, you know, safe safety play there, but that world is changing. And, and I'm curious how, it is. you know, how are you adapting your organization for that environment? It's, you couldn't have set it up any better. And I, I think the idea here, what's important is that it, it might be the safe play, but because of the legacy, but I, I want to build on that legacy, but I also want to go beyond it, right? So one of the things that we're doing is we transform to an, an, an agile uh, business agility model, which means basically, are we iterative? Are we adaptive? Are we responsive? And that's uh, over, by the way, being static and stuck and um, and uh, reactive. So if you feel like you fit those last three, there's there's hope for you because there's a way to not be that way. And and for us, you know, we've we have to lean into the legacy by making sure we stick to the DNA. The DNA of who we are is very important, but the expression of that DNA should change. So the, the metaphor that I use for that, and this is true for any organization that wants to adapt and, and not just survive, but thrive, is it's kind of like a caterpillar to butterfly, right? Or tadpole to frog. The DNA of the caterpillar is the exact same DNA in a butterfly, but the expression of that DNA is so, is so different, it's unrecognizable on purpose. That's not a whoops. That's not a, well, we left our caterpillarness behind um, and now we regret it and all we have is this butterflyness. Now, no, we, we we are still us. It's the same organism, right? Yeah. But instead of a, a instead of a, a, you know, being in a catechist stage where you've got this, um, um, this, this chemical reaction making the change, we have a, an intentional leadership reaction making the change. And what does that mean? It means that we put five values out there, respect, openness, courage, empathy, and trust. And if at any time anybody doesn't feel at least all five at the same time, if, we, if even one is off, we have not just a responsibility, but the right and the safety to speak to it, because mm -hmm. that's how we go. How do, how do we how do we become what we're not yet? And that's a super healthy way to look at it. The other thing is we have three values, uh, our five five values, three principles, and those three principles. This is are, this is your kind of the, the, when you say this, this is, is the, the way. IBM playbook. This is the this is the way. The, playbook. the way I'm like leading that. agile so, sales to say, look, you, this the, is the way. By the way, right things. out of uh, right out of Star Wars, <laughs> right out of the and, and take yeah. it, run with yeah. it, modify yeah. it, use it for yeah. you because it's it's just you know I, there's no nothing new under the sun. We're we're taking stuff that's worked and we're just constantly saying, does it still work? And why is that? And why is it not? And what can we do? So we've landed on respect, openness, courage, empathy, trust, rocket, or OCET. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. super easy. And it's it's one of those things we we don't just say it, we act it. People don't believe what you say, they believe what you do, right? So your actions matter. Mm -hmm. 
And then the three principles are, hey, do we have clarity with purpose? Do we know our why? And our why is not more revenue. Hurrah, our why is not a better stock price. Our why is not quarterly performance quotas. Our why should be what value are we creating to living for the benefit of others, those we serve, mm. whether it's our business partners or prospects or clients. And mm. that why drives it because that's a client centric approach, not an IBM centric approach. So that's uh, our caterpillar to butterfly idea. The second thing that we say is, hey, are we experimental? So if you aren't able to experiment frequently, which means have small, low cost failures to learn from and be excited about that, because that means you're learning. Failure is not failure until it's final, right? So if you're learning, was it really failure or was it just a learning opportunity, right? You've got to be able to take the losses and the wins together. But what you're trying to do is say, we don't punish the losses. We learn from the losses. You're so right. there's not a punitive environment. And then the third thing is we say, hey, are we self-directed? So we change the role of managers. This is a really big one from saying mm -hmm. a manager directs and controls to a manager supports and provides. So what does that look like? It means a manager says, I have two jobs. One, to skill you up and help you be as successful as possible. Number two, to get all the junk, move all the crap out of your way. So I'm an impediment remover. So if it's something in your way and you're in sales, if you're doing non-sales revenue generating work, why are you doing it? Yeah. Well, I have to do this. I have to do that. Why do you have to do it? And right. so as a, as a, as a manager, I'm, I'm now serving it's servant leadership. I'm serving leadership. rather than directing. I'm describing a destination, not prescribing a turn by turn pre described route on a map. It's already got the highlighters and the turns. I'm instead of saying, here's a destination, here's the budget, here's a GPS. Let me know not only how it goes, but what happened when you got there and what you recommend we do next. So instead of telling, I'm asking. So the, the narrative I would use, and then I'll stop talking, but the narrative I use for that is very simple. I say, it's kind of like saying, I want you to go to Chicago and be there from Dallas, Fort Worth, where I live, you know, Dallas, Chicago, be there by Friday. Make sure you visit these three clients. Okay. Make sure you don't spend more than X. And then the sales team come back and then they go, yeah, we went, but here's the thing. There was terrible traffic. GPS took us around. It was so bad due to road closure. We ended up going through Kansas city, believe it or not. And it was nuts. But while we're there at lunch, we realize we're like in this tech hub and we start hearing conversations. And so the next thing we know, we're, we're having lunch conversation with a couple of people. And now we go and say, we're going to come back and meet with you. So, hey, we went to Chicago. We did. It was great. But, you know, Kansas City is this thing. We didn't even have it on our radar and it was amazing. Mm. Now, mm. that's that story illustrates three things. One. I didn't tell them how to get to Chicago and what they exactly what to do. I didn't direct them. I described. So I didn't prescribe I described. Number two, I asked them to tell me what happened on the trip because the learning is not just the destination. The learning is the journey. And then the third thing is I asked them for what we should do next. And what's the third thing? Not go back to Chicago. Not that Chicago's bad. I love Chicago. They found an opportunity in Kansas City. They want to go back to Kansas City. They should probably go to Kansas City. And that's so different than how most managers manage today, especially in a quota driven environment. So my job is to say, how do I help individually motivated, individually compensated people work together as a team? And that's really the value we're, we're learning together. It's fascinating. So I'm going to try to connect the dots a little bit for some of the audience that is newer to sales, right? Or is it maybe kind of, a, you know, in, uh, in parts of the organization that support sales. So historically, the enterprise sales and large organization had to run a little bit in the top-down military style um, lingo. You know, there was even terminologies like theater of operations is right out of, you know, the European theater. Like, okay, this is exactly what military folks wrong. would say, right? Like, so there is that, and it's exciting to some degree, right? And it's, there's like the very hierarchical structure, uh, the reporting, you know, in terms of forecasting, everything has to go up. And, you know, obviously the military doctrine has changed recently, right? The development doctrine has changed, uh, you know, which is the word agile where, you know, it comes from. Um, the marketing doctrine is, is also trying to change, right? Can, you know, can mm -hmm. we have been more creative? Can we have user generated, employee generated, et cetera, content? We are relate to, um, we live in the content world. So we kind of, we think agile content, which you can create quickly on the fly, adapt, learn from 
you know, that's changing the way the content production has worked uh, historically in a kind of more centralized fashion. And so we see this broad trend uh, happening, probably starting with smaller organizations. But I think the transition that you're driving is like, you still have to report like an IBM, right? You still have to have some degree of structure and process. You have to protect the very- It's um, the only thing that scales. Significant yeah. brand, right? Like a reputation. So you have to kind of balance some degree of structure, but but there is that sort of, you know, you're imbuing just like in the US military doctrine that's changing and some of the other disciplines, you're imbuing more room for finding creative solutions for people growing, learning, and, and experimenting. Am I capturing this in the larger zeitgeist of the change that you see in the sure, world? Sure. Overall, I would say that's a pretty helpful thing. And in fact, military terminology is still used in a lot of sales things I've heard. You know, we're going to go attack this deal and, and we're going to, you know, win this thing. So it's it's very much battle mentality thinking. Yeah. And I, I challenge that all the time, by the way. I challenge yeah. that all the time. Because I know the spirit of it is not um, conquest, but the language is. And so I don't want to conquer my clients. I want to serve yeah. my clients. I want to partner yeah. with my clients. We're not here and, to rape um, and pillage, you know, the old fashioned no. way. Like this is Gosh. like, you're trying Gosh. to create a, you're trying to create a mutually, you know, beneficial long-term relationship and potentially even That's drive it. business away if you can't meet it successfully, right? Like you That's such a powerful deal. thought. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what I say is, you know, we're not here to get the deal. We're here to make them successful, which is why when you go back to the thing I said earlier, we're trying to create and deliver value. So the business has goals. And I can hear somebody in the audience in my mind saying, yeah, but I still got quota. Yeah. So how does this all work? Well, we still have goals, right? We, we should have goals. You should have a vision of the way you want to be perceived and, and, and utilized in the world. We should. So we do. We have goals. And so we'll say, these are the goals. And then we say, okay. Hey, teams, if the goals are X, Y, and Z for this market, this product, this whatever vertical, what would you say are the best ways we can create and deliver value based on your experience working with these partners, your experience working with these clients, your experience here listening to prospects? What, what are you hearing? What is your take? And we want them to come up with, this is that idea of, of ex experimenting, uh, experimental mindset is to say, hey, what could we do to create and deliver value? We call that an objective. And each objective then I should align to, if we do this well, this goal probably gonna be hit, has a very high likelihood of being achieved. But we're not doing it so that IBM wins, we're doing it so that they win. Because funny enough, no one buys from your enterprise because they wanna be a profit center for you. But that's how we often treat them. You know, enterprise often treats clients as though they're our profit center. Well, they, yeah. here's a, there's nothing wrong with profit in the sense that if I'm not profitable, I'm not in business. So you want me to make a profit because that's how I continue to serve you. But the value should be so much greater than the investment you're making. So what we yeah. want to do is say, what's the return? How do we frame this around? What is your pain or opportunity? The only two reasons they're talking to us anyways, right? Pain or opportunity. Welcome to sales. If I'm addressing a pain <laughs> and creating an opportunity, I mean, gold. Right. And the way I frame this is that you, you have to have that alignment, clarity with alignment to say, are we creating, delivering value? How would we measure progress? Key result. O K R objective key result. Mm -hmm. How would we measure progress towards achieving that? And does achieving that likely lead to a very satisfied client that would also achieve the business goals we have? That's called win win. Everybody wins. There's no conquest. There's no um, right. battle. This is this is a this is a service opportunity. And so we look at it as how do we serve them well? And if you do that relationally in B2B sales in particular, what you're building is a way to go, how do I help you be successful? How do I make you the hero at your job? How do I help your company? And then how do we listen back to that and say, what's working well? Not just did yeah. I make the sale, but, but what's happening? How's that going? What else could we do? And cross sell and upsell or maybe part of that solution, may not, but we always wanna have that partnership mindset that you described so well because mm. that's how you really create a long lasting, what we call lifetime value, LTV. And lifetime value is usually described what's in it for us. You know, if, if you're in an enterprise and someone buys more than once, it's probably gonna be an exponentially more valuable client experience over the time for your, yeah. your books. Sure, true. But that's kind of like the byproduct. The real value is that they continue to receive value and they find so much value that they keep coming back and then they want more value. So it's what's in it for them, um, not what's in it for us as the primary driver. So what you're describing is really um, 
a very healthy definition of the sales profession, right? Like, and it's sort of the opposite of the Willy Loman, you know, stereotypes, right? Of the, you know, just kind of selling whatever is necessary. Or, you know, actually, when you brought up the the metamorphosis from, uh, from uh, you know, into a butterfly, I thought of the opposite metamorphosis where, you know, Franz Kafka has a book by that name where, you know, a, a, a salesman one morning wake, wakes up as a giant insect, right? And it's sort of a, a very, you know, very sc scary kind of notion if you think about it, because I think fundamentally the sort of the, if you remain the old style or kind of whatever the stereotype of the sales person, right? Like, a, you know, aggressive, rah, 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 forcing, you know, products, you know, into people's lives, you, you're that insect, right? You become the annoyance, right? That is showing up as a spam, which I'm sure you and I get, you know, plenty of in, you know, in a day-to-day -day thing. And now the spam yep. is powered by AI powered insects that are kind of like just pretending, you know, that they really, they care, like pseudo personalizing it and sort of like, like just overwhelming people with a ton of approaches, information. And so these are sort of some of the tactics um, that, you know, maybe IBM doesn't have to do, but a lot of folks that are trying to break in, create new categories, new products are deploying to grab some attention, right? To, you know, at scale. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the and, and some people would call it agile, right? Because it's like, it's automated, it's, you know, it's high volume, you know, so- That doesn't make tell it- Tell us agile, about it. Right, that doesn't, that's not your definition, obviously, but like guide yeah. us a little bit about like, what's the risk that we have of not changing into the agile, right? Like, so like as, as a great person, sure. great, great salespeople always paint, like what's the opposite of not, you know, going down this path of change that they, they have to like, what's the outcomes of not deploying a particular solution. So what's the cost for people of not becoming agile sales leaders and producers? So agility is a, is a belief, not a thing to do. Right. Yeah. So uh, you would, you would, might hear it in software. We have stand-ups, we have retrospectives, yeah. all these terms that really came from scrum um, inside yeah. of it. But what, what we're doing is, is not that what we're saying is, Hey, how do we work together to realize what we can mitigate, eliminate, or optimize on the downside, right? So we, we mm -hmm. reduce downside to increase better upside. And we do that internally by making feedback actionable. So we solicit feedback at scale. That's one of the big things you do. You mm. ask the people closest to the problem, what's the problem? And what's interesting is they almost always, always have an idea about what the solution is too. And mm. so we do that through um, uh, multiple methods. I created a thing called the retrospective radar, which you can look up, but it, it's this idea of saying, if we capture feedback, then feedback's a gift. True. What I want to do is say, but aggregated feedback captured at scale is actionable intelligence because now yeah. I have trend analysis. Now I have, so, and this works not just with your internal teams. This also works cross-functionally with marketing and product. And I think marketing product and sales should be tight at the hip because we all have the same ultimate outcome that we're aiming for, maybe different outputs, but same outcome. And so what we do is we do cross-functional teams to say, how do we bring those three people together? And then say those three groups together to work on what we're hearing from the end users, what we're hearing from the prospect, what we're hearing from our business partners. And we're using that to validate the data because we have numbers. Everybody's got their numbers, their clicks, their this, their opportunity pipeline, their conversion rates, whatever. Great. Have your numbers. What we want to know is if the number says this, but the feedback says this way down here. What is that delta and why does it exist? So what we want is to say real agility has asks better questions. It does not have better answers. Real agility asks better questions. It does not have better answers. So we start looking for, well, why mm -hmm. is that gap so great? Why does the number say one thing, but the feedback's another? Because if we just run on the numbers, I guarantee you're wrong, right? right. Guarantee it. And so what we want to do is say, how do we validate those numbers with feedback? And this, by the way, sounds like work because it is. But the value of it is that you're not irrelevant. Look, if, if you hate change, you're going to really hate irrelevance. So I think the <laughs> idea of agility is how do you come around and say, what does it look like to be adaptable, to be flexible, to be nimble and not react, but respond, right? Because one of those is about foresight and intent. And so I can't read the future, but I can sure pay attention and I can listen. 
And so, you know, the two ears, one mouth thing, you should listen twice as much as you speak if you're in sales. That's true. And what we want to do is say, but are we solving their pain? Are we addressing their opportunity? And if we're not, why is that? Is it the product? Is it our service? Is it our offering? Is it our understanding? Mm. And should we do something different? So if you want to remain relevant, you have to not just change with the times. You actually have to, um, I think of the Bruce Lee quote of, you know, be like water. You know, it, water in a bottle takes the shape of the bottle. Water in a cup takes on the form of the cup. And so what's the cup today? Well, the cup is that there's a more empowered prospect than ever before. They have more information, yeah. more bad information too, but they have more information, more time to, to do the research and figure things out before they ever talk to you. We recognize that. So we use AI as part of that. And so we have Watson X. And so we have the ability to say, and anybody could use our, our software. It's not just limited to us, right? We make it for others too. But it's this idea of saying, how do we figure out what, what's best to create where AI does the stuff that it doesn't take a human to do, right? That it, we could do things that make it really easy for you to self-qualify and not have to get harassed by a salesperson. What could you do? What could we do to make that really easy and surface things to you that make sense? Whether that's a chat bot that listens and doesn't just come up with pre-scripted answers, but actually learns and over time says, if you're interested in that, you might also want to check this out. Or um, seems like you're still looking for this. Can I mm. offer this? And, and now you have this really great experience where the customer is driving, not us. We want the prospect and the customer to drive it because it's their problem, their opportunity to solve, right? And what we're here to go is, and we're ready when you are. So when we get somebody, we have a much higher qualified lead. So the MQLs are much better, which means the conversion to SQL, sales qualified lead, is much better. And so now you have a much more satisfied clients because they don't feel like they're talked to too soon or too often. Um, they're not yeah. getting that locust swarm effect, right? Of the insects just swarming them with automation. And I know where we are reflective and responsive. This not, is music to um, our ears. Reactive. You know, I, th I think what you're describing <laughs> is exactly, you know, like I, I couldn't have phrased it, phrased it better is that sort of, you know, I fill out my form, you know, and the, like just to get some white paper and I just get either, you know, forced to read 50 page manuscript on my phone that wants to suck the life out of uh whatever energy i have in my in my <laughs> professional life and uh and then i'm bombarded by folks that kind of don't even know what i've clicked on what i've read if i've read anything they're kind of they're just like oh you must be interested in this when i actually didn't end up reading it and it's just sort of this um the the, the kind of the playbook right and i and i really like your your, your quote that if you don't like change, <laughs> boy, you're not going to like irrelevance, right? Like the playbook and marketing and the playbook and the sales follow-up has to change in the world where information is no longer scarce, right? And, and I think what you're describing is the sort of agile adaptation to the customer, right? If they want to consume content first and, you know, you want to create that digital experience pre-meeting that's really engaging in the meeting though, mm -hmm. those agile sales reps are not showing up with a monologue of slides, right? Like that's sort of linear. I imagine they, they say, Hey, it sounds like you're interested in a, B and C or customers like, like you in the past have, have, you know, had ABC issues, which one do you want to, uh, which one resonates, which one do you want to address today? And then they go on a particular journey that, that is more relevant to that customer. You know, how and, are you, how are you driving? And, but it's, but it's a non, but it, Alex, it's a nonlinear journey. See people yeah. used to, that's an important distinction I want to throw in there. Sorry for interrupting yeah. you, but it's this yeah. really important thought. It's not A, B, C, D. It's A, E, L, B, C, yeah. B, C, A. You know, it's like, it's anything but linear yeah. anymore because the yeah. way that this, we get the information. It's not a funnel. It's a B doing a little it's all uh, over it's, the it's, place yeah yeah, yeah exactly right yeah, and, yeah. and we don't try to force you in a funnel right yeah. are there stages to progression of course there are right there's still yeah, discovery yeah. phase there's still engagement phase but but we we don't make you and that's kind of what's powerful and we're getting better at this we don't do this perfectly but we're getting yeah. better at this and it's it's really this this idea of so how do we create and deliver value how do we measure that value over time and how do we decide this is the key should we keep creating that value 
So yeah. we, one of the things we've done is we, we've got a, a group I work with um, where strategically we work on a certain type set of products to put digital enablers on a website, for example. So maybe a mm-hmm. pricing estimator or an ROI mm-hmm. calculator or um, a, a, you know, a demonstration or something. Mm-hmm. And what mm-hmm. we do is we don't just measure the performance of it. We measure the performance of that over time to say, did it create enough lift to keep doing that? Does it actually end up being, and we have attribute tracking. So you have an attribution model to say, if this, then they did this. And we have all that data in the background to understand over time, statistically likelihood of of success. And so that along with feedback, right? Data with feedback tells us, should we keep doing that or should we change it? Um, This form has too many fields. That might be a very easy thing for marketing to go, well, yeah, but we need to know this. Do we need to know it on day one or could we learn that by day five? or the fifth visit. And yeah. maybe we use progressive formatting. So now with the field, the first time just gives, you know, who, how can we help you? you? Just give it your name and email and we'll, you know, give you this. Or sometimes you don't even gate it, you just give it to them. Yeah. But eventually you get one bit of information and if they're on the same device and they keep coming back, which they usually are, I mean, in this kind of yeah. enterprise stuff, they're gonna be on their, comp- their computer again um, or their phone, sure, but they're the gonna come back mm-hmm. and we have a tracking and now we start to understand, yeah. oh, yeah. hey, it's you, it's, it's Alex is back. Alex, it's great to see you back. Yeah. Hey, we got this webinar. Would you like to sign up for it? If so, give us, you know, this one field. And now it's, an, but see, yeah. five times it's later, I have five fields. Of a, if equivalent, if you show up to a party, right? And you've met like 90% of the people there last week, but you weren't paying attention and you didn't remember any of their names and there's no <laughs> name tags, <laughs> you're like, you're going to look like an idiot, right? Like you're going to, you're going to like, it's going to be very obvious that you were like checked out and like, you could have, you know, you could like introduce yourself, you could do some ticks around there, but generally like this lack of awareness of what's going, you know, what's happened, you know, we're, you know, we call it digital body language and the kind of in the, in the, in the world that you're describing, right. It's cool language. I like that. Yeah. So like, it's sort of, and you, you and I know, like, you know, in the conversation, you're like, let's let's dive into here or like somebody's really interested right that's congruence Mm -hmm. and i think what what you're describing is you know like there's a risk if the organizations are not agile that they will be there's a huge risk there this is just like like i'm very excited to welcome you back right like that's not that's not that's (laughs) exciting that's exciting right like but people do that like we are delighted to present 90 page summary of this you know research report right? right like it's not a 90 page like it's sort of it's the length sometimes it's the language itself sometimes it's a combination of the medium the kind of the, mm-hmm. the 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 context but you know without the tracking i think this is to your point you know you're not you're not able to be agile fundamentally right like because it's a one you way you cannot be responsive for sure yeah. It, yeah. it, you could be as good as the the seller's memory and capability are in their own processes, in their own discipline, right? But that doesn't scale. People don't scale systems and processes do. The trick with any of this, right, is not to be big brotherish, right? So you don't yeah. want it to be like, well, we know it's you and we have five questions to ask. It can't exactly. be like that. But but what you're really doing is you're creating a customer-centric experience. So for their experience, how great can you make it yeah. so that they can either self-qualify or self-dequalify, which is just as useful, by the way, right? Yeah. Because Because if people, and and this is a phrase I talk about a lot, if people believe what you believe and value what you value, it's shut up and take my money, right? That's just easy. If they believe what you believe, but do not yet value what you value, you have a chance to explain that value and then you can convert. If they don't believe and don't value, probably never going to be a great customer. I mean, honestly, they're probably the wrong That's fit. There's probably a there. better they, they fit. They got for... there by accident, yeah. right? So and, and if we, <laughs> yeah. and if we yeah. were to convert them and convince them and that's not what they value, ultimately, they're not going to be a satisfied customer. That ends up harming our brand reputation because they won't speak kindly of us, right? So why would we try to be a poor fit, right? So this it, is and that's hard really for really a... beautiful. What you're described is... Um, Sorry to interrupt, but like I, I you know, because in the startup world, from where I've been, you know, you know, can we bridge the enterprise who we work with, but also like we we speak the startup lingo. There's sort of this sort of product market fit terminology and ideal customer profile terminology, and I've never heard it described the way you just did this was the two by two, which by the way we should capture in a, in the in a follow up to this if you have <laughs> sure. a, if you have a visual for this. 
because it, it's it's um fundamentally profound opportunity because because it's very easy to get confused like we value intro you know that values are not enough right sometimes you hit the jackpot like that you know the beliefs and the the what what the perceived value for the customers are aligned, but it's just not always there. And I I think people that have oversimplify it. There's like oh well you you know you just find that ideal customer profile and they're always perfect. No, I think especially if you're introducing new things to the market, you know, like majority of the people are not going to be you know are champions of this out of the box they need to understand what you're doing and they kind of need to connect it to their experiences in their head and that's that opportunity to you know say hey you're broadly believer in the principles but here's you know our approach and why that may align with you and i, I just i haven't heard any you're, you're right that it eloquently. Is it's cool. I actually did that during a keynote for one of these, uh, a smaller company, really cool company um, that I was fun to do where I was sharing this concept and it was the big thing that really resonated, right? How do you, how do you visually represent the insights? And this is hard, right? Because if you don't start with a model, uh, you quickly devolve into spreadsheets and uh, that's not a compliment. <laughs> so yeah. uh, you have a model that helps you keep it a kind of a North star, you know, it's our litmus test for how are we doing? And, and I think it's useful because the, the value comes when people begin to think differently. I actually don't try to change behaviors at IBM. Mm. I try to change minds. Because if I change your behavior, the only way I can force that is compliance. Well, that's anti-agile. Because what I would be doing is saying, hey, I want you to be self-authorized. Uh, um, I want you to be self-directed. I want you to, to, to experiment greatly, but do it exactly this way. <laughs> Whoops, yeah. right? Fail. So instead, I what I do is I invite people. Leader. Here's a hundred page <laughs> manual. <laughs> yeah. And, and don't deviate from it. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's the thing. So in order to demonstrate it, I have to actually invite people and I offer, I mm -hmm. offer for people to step into things. Now, there are some things we do have to do, right? So I do have a boundary, what I like to call it the, the guardrails, right? Mm -hmm. Way at the edges, but how you decide to work in space inside those edges up to you because I want you to discover something, not just follow something. And if I change your mind, guess what? Your behaviors follow. Yeah. It's just a reality of human age. Psychology has this well-documented. If I can change your mindset, change your thoughts around something, your behaviors will follow. And here's the really interesting thing. Your behaviors will stick. If you implement something if through compliance, the moment it doesn't stick is the moment when no one's looking, right? So it doesn't last. So why would I go down that path? And this is very different, you know, in most enterprises, you use the term command and control. Other. Yeah, that's a hard shift. It's a yeah. hard shift away from that because it's what got us here. And what I'm saying to every enterprise is what got you here will not get you where you're going. The world has well, changed. So let's, let, let's double click on this behavior. So I'm, I'm a believer in the mindset. So I think I'm, I'm generally, you know, in agreement with this. But one of our mentors um, is a gentleman by the name B.J. Fogg, a Stanford professor who has a behavioral change model. And, you know, he has variables like your motivation, which is, I would put in the mm -hmm. mindset. Intrinsic right? like versus one, extrinsic, two, right? Right, like, right. So, so that's key, but there's other variables, right? And the, one mm -hmm. of them is like ease, how easy or, or difficult is the task, right? Like, right. is this like a, do I have to become a, you know, I've never read anything and I have to read War and Peace. That's a difficult task, right? Or, Correct. you know, versus like, you know, read a little snippet of wisdom that that's relevant that's going to make your life interesting you know that's kind of how you get to war and peace eventually um you know uh, if you're kind of talking of reading and then the other one is the trigger right like is that book mm -hmm. right at my um uh, uh, right at my um uh bad bad stand right i can i can just pick it up and it's really easy and it's the first thing i you know i see when i wake up not the phone and it's the the last thing when i go when i go to bed and so it sure. becomes the sort of prompt for it. And so his model, it, it actually says, well, yeah, yes, you need to change the motivation, but some behaviors, right, that are, well, if you make them easy, they also kind of help you get into more motivated, right? Because you're building that confidence, you know, that yes, I'm the type of person that reads, you know, nuggets of philosophy versus like, you know, inaculates myself every night with some, you know, mass produced media that that kind of destroys value in my life right and so that people start then because of that easy behavior the trigger you know they they are going after it so 
you know, is there a version of this in sales where you see some behavioral changes uh, that are actually like just little, little steps, little bets? That's the point. To help people That's the point, right? I don't, but I don't lead with behavior change is my point. Mm. I don't lead with, you need to do this. That's compliance, mm. right? So what's the trigger? My command. That's not the trigger we're looking for. We're looking for an intrinsic motivation, not an extrinsic motivation, mm. right? Hit the quota or else extrinsic motivation mm. be more successful have a better quality of life intrinsic motivation right and everybody's intrinsic is a little bit different so the trigger for one is not the trigger for another that's why i say change minds because the behaviors mm. follow well whose behaviors the unique behaviors of the people based on their worldview their culture their values and so ultimately we get down the same path you know or the same destinations with parallel paths, but I, I don't make them is what I'm saying. Do very many things. Mm. In fact, I only prescribe two things. The rest I describe because I, I really want them to get there. There are mm. some things we do need to do, but we visualize our work, right. And we communicate frequently about, Hey, what's working, what's adding value, what's not adding value. And what are we learning? Those are the two things I require. That's it. That's interesting. So this is actually a little, like I would say my, my worldview is that the way software works, it, it can actually does, does things a little bit different. And that's sort of probably why you're doing more, you know, a mind change, right? And a philosophical change in the way the organization functions. The way software is actually hones in on these little behavioral habits, right? And it tries to turn them into something that's just habitual, easy to do. Uh, you get yeah. some intrinsic or extrinsic rewards where it's like, like, but sort of, and then it can becomes like you go build on that habit. I think it sounds like you're doing a more global shift, but it, then that leads to those habits and people define those habits on their own right. in, in a way that's relevant to them. It's slightly different. And, and, right. And, and usually what works for one will work for several. So the sharing yeah. among the team about what's adding value for them it ends up being yeah. a useful construct because now you're skipping the pain of, of figuring that out yourself and you're applying the wisdom of someone else who already experienced the pain, right? So there's the value of that. And it's and when you do that at scale, right? This is the thing about feedback at scale. Now you start saying, it's not just your team. That's not just you. We hear that a lot. And, and here's yeah. how so-and-so solved it. And here's this, this person addressed it. This team no longer has this issue that you're talking about. Wow, how do they have that? Right. So yes, I won't disagree with uh, the Stanford professor. He's, he's right. My point is that if you're going to really make that stick, you may not have all the levers to make it simple at first. You might not be able to do all those yeah. things. You may have the environment that you're in is complex. And so you're going to start with the complexity where it's at and, and you are going to let them discover a little bit at a time um, because that's the invitation. And it's always an invitation because yeah. if I make you do it, suddenly we're anti-agile. The way someone described this is that there's a difference between agile and fragile. Like they were talking about fragile and they said, yeah. what's the opposite of fragile? And mine went like resilient, um, strong. And, and the answer was there actually is no real antonym to it. The, the thing about it is it's anti-fragile. So yeah. here's this idea is if I took a wine glass and I threw it at the ground, it would shatter. But if it was a really anti-fragile glass, then somehow the energy it, of hitting the ground would strengthen it and the impact would make it stronger and would bounce back up and be a better glass than when I threw it. Right, the, the rubber ground. roll glass. You, the, I think we have a new product here. The <laughs> we have a new product. Glass. It's, it's going to be great. <laughs> Throw your wine glasses. Watch them bounce right yeah. back up. Um, but think about people. It, or, or, or give me one more example, and then I'll talk about people. Trees. We have a little tiny tree out in the front of our yard. We have a relatively new neighborhood, a few years old, and so there's these little trees. And they always put these stakes on the ground with 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 these uh, mm -hmm. ropes tied around it on four sides to hold the little tiny tree upright during the winds. But there's a point where our our, our horticulturist, Dr. Moon, says, make sure once the tree is is the, this size that you remove those ropes quickly because the wind pressing against it is what lets it grow stronger. The resistance yeah. it has to face is what makes it stronger over time. And so it goes with humans. If you want to get better at something, persevere. Persevere. Oh. Get stronger through the resistance. Resistance training in weights or resistance training for athletes. Same thing, right? Get better through the resistance. So we see the same thing. And, and I'm mm. trying to say, so how do we do that? 
all we're trying to do uh, for, for the people, the span of care that I have is make it where they can have an experience they've never had before and have something so much better they would never want to go back, right? Mm. That, because if we do that, we will by default, right, with this focus on client centricity, we will be a value creating organization and people will be value receiving and then we'll be value co-creating together. There's no way someone's going to say, I want a better price on higher value. <laughs> right? right. It, yeah. It's just the price is because if value is the point, price is not. If price is the point, I guarantee you value is not. We yeah, like there's nothing beats value. the experience of having a really symbiotic relationship with your customer where Correct. you feel like you're a hand in hand, you're solving a right. problem, you're bringing your best, they're bringing your best, you're kind of learning. Like, and we love customers from whom we learn, right? And they may not be like always easy right because they may challenge no. some of the assumptions that we've had good especially and this is great that's the great like thank you <laughs> yes it felt mm -hmm. like we didn't need that thing the roadmap but we heard it from you we know you care we know you understood you know we we think you had worthy goals you're kind of and so that made us they'd opened us our eyes and and you know that feedback so that's, a, that's the feedback validating those data points right but then it's it's just it's and it's the sort of sense of co-creating, right? And that's like, you know, if you're in a in a uh, relationship where you have kids, right? You're co-creating kids, right? Arguably, I do very little of them compared to my my, <laughs> my, my, my my lovely wife, but but it's still, you know, a sense that you've co-created something that becomes this tree, right? That kind of doesn't need your boundaries anymore. That's, so what you're saying is you're creating that experience for, for salespeople, right? Like, so they yes. become these um right. you know they it's it's about i mean maybe less of like production delivering killing killing it it's more about like giving you know nurture giving a nurture the forest right, right. Of like that that keeps on giving and gives shade to your business and you know that so and that's a beautiful visual right yeah. like yeah i love it i love it win I, win, I, I, win 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 everybody win, win. wins so, so one thing, so we've talked about sales, right? Like, so this sort of, like, I, I'm bought into what you're doing, obviously. Um, so we tend to um, love other disciplines that support sales teams and becoming more responsive, more customer centric. So obviously mm -hmm. there's customer, su customer support team that's working with the customers, but another one that has a lot of um, scalability uh, opportunity is marketing. Right. And Absolutely. so for an agile sales team to really work, right, they can't come up, come, you know, show up with monolithic marketing content and marketing no. process that is centralized. There is fewer marketers than salespeople. So they may kind of, they, they may feel overwhelmed by supporting all the unique flavors of customers and needs and industries of the, like, you know, a platform like IBM has to support. Right. So, how um, how can marketing be more agile and support those say, agile sales organizations? So, funny enough, that's where I got my start. So in 2009, I worked for a software as a service company. I was hired as the director of communications. It was a brand new role made up for me by the CEO. Mm. Wanted me to come in. He knew my skills and said, I want you to lead this. And so I was introduced. And as I walked around this 100 person, I was employee 99. And as I walked around the whole, we had the whole floor of this building, I went to the developers area. And they had this 60 foot wide, 10 foot tall magnetic whiteboard with all these really cool colored postcards all over it. And I was like, what is this? I'm like, Oh, this is scrum. And I'm like, rugby? I'm like, no, no. Um, and so <laughs> it was it was a flavor of agile, right? One of the one of the things actually predates agile, but that's kind of not important. It, so it's this idea of how do they iterate together. And so the teams decided what to work on the teams decided the prioritization of the effort against a roadmap. And it was super interesting. Well, for me, it was super valuable because I could hear about the product uh, changes that were coming so that I could let our users know, hey, this is coming, expect this. But then also, it was also marketing fodder because now I have something new to promote to prospects. So it was really useful. And so I started applying Agile marketing in 2009, really early. And I'm now part of the Agile Marketing Alliance, agilemarketingalliance.com, I think is the website, um, uh, where I write all the time over there, put a lot of content over there. I love helping them because in my mind, marketing and sales should be tight at the hip. In 2019, Agile Marketing at IBM uh, had digital sales rolled up underneath Agile Marketing, which I thought was great. And um, I was brought in to say, you know, Agile Marketing 
agile marketing works with the uh, with digital sales or owns digital sales for now. And so c- can we be agile to the core in sales, not just marketing? And I said, I believe so, but I'm going to have to invent it because it's not been done at scale. Mm. And so they gave me a lot of, a lot of leeway. And what I did is this is where I worked with the marketing the people who are already becoming uh, agile marketers. We had coaches specifically for this and I was on that team and I just had the sales side of it. But we, it was really obvious that the respect, openness, courage, empathy, trust that they had would apply perfectly to sales. So we took the same values and then I only modified the principles just very slightly for sales. But basically, we're, we're, we're aligned. Two different organizations and a huge organization like IBM, yeah. right? It was sales yeah. and marketing. But the customer should never feel that. They should That's never right. feel, oh, because no one comes to your website. It's like, you know what I'd love to be a part of is a drip nurture campaign. And it would yeah. just be fantastic if I could be handed off to a business partner so that I could be then trolled by a salesperson. Like no one wants that, but a lot of <laughs> enterprises make it go that way. We wanted to say, how do we make a seamless experience? So all they get is the brand. All the experience is the value yeah. that IBM brings for them. And that means internally we work like crazy. It's like a duck, right? On water. On the top, it looks so smooth, but underwater, the the feet are, both feet are pedaling furiously, right? Yeah. We needed to do that together. And so by, by having the coaching shared, right, it really made that a lot more realistic. And it was a big part of my early success uh, was because we had agile marketing in place that made the agile sales piece work so much easier versus having to do it all at once. It would have been a much more difficult journey. So this is, this is where they're still kind of separate, but aligned. And I think now what's interesting that's happening, just kind of want to like get your last thoughts on this as we, as we wrap up, it almost feels like the, the best marketers and particularly in the B2B world need to understand what are the best salespeople do the agile salespeople, right. And create the type of experiences for the customers that mimic the sort of transformational sales experience where he's jointly solving for a particular problem. Co-creation. Client, co-creation, right? That's marketers need to do that now, not just salespeople. Yes, sir. Obviously they need to enable sales team with the tools, but it, it, sometimes even customers don't want to talk to sales for a long time, right? Like even at right. great places. And they, so how do, the, how do you maintain that conversation? And then the vice versa, the production expectation right in an in a, in an area where there's a lot of noise or a lot of information so if a sales person shows up looking unprofessionally looking like you know i don't know with slides or pd or whatever pdfs that are built by their grandpa back in the you know 80s in a basement somewhere you know that that takes away from all that good work on the brand side of things Right, that is sort of noise that that kind of doesn't contribute to that perception of a journey, and um, so and, and you know as you know historically, like sales teams are not designers, right? Like they're this is not a core kind of strength. They may design an experience for a customer, but certainly you know flies would not be core strength. Mm-hmm. And so, how do you uh, create that? You know, sales people, best salespeople become a little bit more like marketers, and best marketers become a lot more like sales. Cross functional teaming. I mean, intentionally putting product uh, owners, so the product team leaders, um, sales leaders, and marketing leaders together, and then bringing their people in to be a part of that. The team members themselves speaking into it. It's not just the leaders, but it's all three. If you don't have all three together, you're going to have a swing and a miss somewhere. It's just inevitable. That's interesting. So, so it's, you, you, it's not it, just sales and marketing, it's sales, marketing, sales, and marketing, and product. Interesting. Yeah. And, and, and basically the, in the, in today's world, product led growth, PLG is very popular because it works, but I find PLG is, is only as effective as your communication, coordination, and collaboration between marketing and sales. And that's a beautiful thought. And I never expected that I would be hearing from IBM sales leader about the value of plg and aligning between plg marketing and sales which is really telling that you're you're just on the bleeding edge of what customers Thank want you. which is uh amazing congratulations we are learning we yeah, are learning. you know i think um as as your fearless leader once said the elephants can dance and it sounds like that you guys are dancing up a storm uh was this sort of agile um approach 
to 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 delivering value to the customer across across the discipline. So really inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing your insights, Anthony. How can pleasure the world uh, connect and and benefit more of that? Short of listening easy. to easy. Yeah, but I love LinkedIn. It's my favorite social platform. So it's Anthony Coppage on LinkedIn or anthonycoppage.com. I mean, you, and you'll have show notes. But uh, Alex, what a pleasure to be here. I hope there's value for someone to take a little bit of value from something that was said today and go apply it to today in their own organization. So thanks for having me. Thank you.